What's up everyone? Welcome to the episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Vlog. This is episode 291, and this is it. This is my Venom movie review. I know a lot of you guys have been waiting for it. Thank you so much for being so patient. We are going to talk about spoilers in this review throughout the review. So if you have not seen the movie, I recommend that you just watch like my first impressions video. It's only about six or seven minutes long. It's got a great intro from Tom Hardy himself, which is really awesome to get. Uh, so thank you IGN and everyone who put that event together. And also Andrew for getting me to go down to the event. That was really awesome. So thank you for uh, making sure I went down there and was a part of that because that lent us, uh, you know, two really great intros from Ruben Fleischer and Tom Hardy. Um, but in this episode, you know, we're going to get a lot more detailed. In that one, I was very broad. I didn't really talk a ton about the movie itself because I wanted to really not give anything away because as you guys I know, you know, as you know about me, I blab a lot. You know, I just kind of have verbal diarrhea and I, I just run and run and run. So this time I actually took some notes in my Eddie Brock journal. I have my likes, my dislikes, a couple Easter eggs that I noticed in the movie. And then also uh, maybe like I'll mention one or two missed opportunities or things that I thought uh, directions I was kind of hoping they would go in in the movie, not, you know, outside the movie. I think a lot of times with these reviews, people like put in what they wish they would have saw in the movie, but they put in something that, you know, just had no chance of being in the movie in the first place. And what I'm going to try to do here is, is not do that. I'm going to try to just talk about the things that are in the movie review the movie as it was given to us because as a critic that's kind of what you're supposed to do uh, there will be negatives i talk about big time and there will be positives and then i'll give my final review at the you know start of this i was kind of at a seven and a half to eight but my score has changed a little bit it has dropped a little bit uh, but we'll get to that at the end of the episode but still overall i had a lot of fun and i would say before we get into spoilers if you have not seen this movie and you're going to stop watching the video here i understand completely uh, i don't want to spoil anything for you so please go watch the movie for yourself and one thing is i'm glad people are doing that this movie is making a pretty good amount of money already it's already uh this is saturday night i've already seen that it's made almost 33 million dollars in just thursday night tickets which was a whopping 10 million dollars for thursday night tickets and then last night uh, which was like, a, you know, 22, almost $23 million for Friday night. So this movie could open up around the 70 to $80 million range, which would be really good for this movie. And what I like about that is that it's fans and people out there and audiences saying, screw you critics, we're going to make up our own minds. And that is no stronger message could be made to critics. Uh, at this time where it feels like critics do influence movies and people going to see movies, it's nice to see people break from that mold over a movie like Venom, no less, and judge for themselves. So whether you love the movie or hate it, I'm glad that you at least went and experienced it for yourself. I personally like the movie overall, so let's get into why that is. Let's start on a positive note. Let's start with the likes. Uh, and then we'll get into the dislikes because there's a lot more likes for this movie for me at least uh, than the dislikes uh, first thing i noticed a lot of reviewers saying is oh this movie feels like it's from you know the early 2000s in a bad way it's like daredevil or ghost rider or catwoman or whatever um and i see people say like oh it, you know the jokes don't land they feel like you know like from a different time period this movie that everyone kept saying that feels like a different time period a lot of these reviewers were confused and i, I you know when you read their tweets you know halfway through they'll have like question marks in their tweets like but it's supposed to do that right or whatever you know like a lot of people seemed not sure how to review this movie and i found that kind of funny because i think the reason they felt like that is because a lot of them made up their minds before they saw it and i think they struggled with the fact that they liked some things in this movie when they just wanted to hate it a lot of them but i did see that you know throughout a lot of the reviewers you know over 170 or so reviewers have reviewed this on Rotten Tomatoes and it is now sitting at like a 33%. I think it went up a little bit or 31%. It keeps going up and down between 28 and 32, 33. Um, so it's bouncing in between there. But I see, you know, at least, at least more positives coming out about it. But seeing that fan reaction, seeing the fan score, the audience score of 88% uh, is outstanding to me because I think that just shows people want something that's just kind of mindless fun and that's what they wanted from a Venom movie and it looks like that's what they got and they were okay with it. They weren't looking for an Academy Award winning movie. They weren't looking for a movie that, you know, uh, played by all the rules that they already knew and they weren't looking for a movie to really, you know, change the landscape of superhero films or anything. Uh, this is something that just feels like a throwback movie to something like the late 80s or late 90s and early 2000s and I think that all that's intentional and some people just didn't like that but it seemed like a lot of people didn't mind it. Uh, and so a lot of people out there are really enjoying at least the ride and they admit that it's not a great solid movie uh, but it is a fun movie and that's kind of where I sit it is a it's a fun movie it's it's fun to watch I was not bored once in this movie I know a lot of people said the opening to them was really boring but for me it was not so on my list of likes just like everyone else my one of my top likes in this movie is Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock this is a character that is not easy to pin down uh, from reading comics and you guys know from this show 
how we've talked about the character from Eddie Brock. We've gone through almost all the 90s comics, like the late 80s when he first appeared in Spider-Man, all the way up to most of his miniseries. And we're going to get back into that in season three. But you've seen how many different voices you know writers have on him, how many different ways they've written them. And even when they just focused with this movie on David Michelini stories, who's a creator, uh, you know, co-creator with Todd McFarlane of Venom, they focused on Lethal Protector, which he wrote, and Planet of the Symbiotes, which David Michelini also wrote. And even with one writer's voice in their head for the character, there is still moments of Eddie just being kind of all over the place. And that's kind of how he is. He's a guy who chooses to, you know, hack, you know, not hack, but, you know, use his girlfriend's password to read her emails and invade her privacy and then use information that was, you know, only sent to her uh, in secret and in confidentiality and exploit that to, uh, you know, to hopefully, you know, get, you know, catch a bad guy on screen, you know, with his camera crew and get Carlton Drake to admit something that, he, you know, he's done. And instead, it just ruined his life. It led to all these moments. And just like in the comic books where Eddie Brock blames all of his problems on Peter Parker and Spider-Man for ruining his life, in the movie, he blames everything on Carlton Drake until Anne confronts him and says, look, it wasn't Carlton Drake. It was you, Eddie. You chose to look at my email. You chose to use that information to try to further your career. You used me. And, uh, and that's why you're in this situation. That's why we're not together. And that was a great moment, I thought. I thought that was one of the better moments between those two characters in this entire movie was that little speech there. I really, really dug it, and I thought it summarized and encapsulated this character so well. So Tom's performance from being a guy who is like, like that at the beginning of the movie is kind of charismatic, and he's like, I don't care where I park my motorcycle, whatever, I'll do whatever I want. Um, seeing him go from that to a guy who's so unsure and he's at the bottom of the barrel i mean he's lost his relationship he can't find a job in the career he wants uh he has to go and uh you know and do you know like he's looking at dishwasher jobs and stuff like that to try to pay the bills uh, he's living in a studio apartment where just like i had lived at one point where it was like hardwood floors and you just have like this one little room in the bathroom right off the living room and you're using a toaster oven to heat up uh, you know p you know potatoes uh you know <laughs> tater tots and stuff it's like i literally lived just like that shopping at routes and picking up stuff when i was watching this movie i was like wow did someone follow me with a camera when I lived in my old apartment where I was like broke and like had nothing uh, and I was just living there and I had loud neighbors at times you know most of my neighbors were pretty chill but every once in a while we would have an incident or two you know in the building um, so it's like it's, it's, it, you know I know other people have lives like that but it was just so crazy like the same brand of tater tots and everything and I was just like wow I'm really connecting with this character which is great because that's I feel connected to Eddie Brock that's why I do this show so for me there was a lot of wins uh, on the side of Tom Hardy even more more so than probably other people liked with his performance as Eddie Brock. And he was doing the, you know, complete nervous breakdown role really well. I mean, think about it. An alien is in his body and he's hearing a voice in his head all the time. Uh, you know, I have constant pain in my head from the health things I go through and it's hard to shut things out and it gets frustrating and you, and you act manic at times and you, it's a it's a lot. It's a lot for other people to deal with. And, it, and this movie showed that really well where Tom is going off the rail and other people have to deal with it. And uh, and it's not fun for them uh, to deal with it. And he looks crazy. And he looks manic. And he looks all these things. Um, and uh, and it was great. Uh, seeing his performance do that. And then seeing him you know, come full circle at the end. And kind of talk to the symbiote by the end of the movie. And be like, look, here's the rules. Here's what we got to do. And kind of get that confidence back. Kind of get that swagger he had back at the beginning of the movie. Kind of see him go in that arc was great. And Tom did a great job in my opinion. Some of the other stuff I loved, I really like the look of Venom. We've talked about that in the previous before. I was unsure 100% if the, the non-spider, you know, if I would have a reaction to that. But I guess since we've been doing the show and I've looked at so many photos and everything of the fact that he has no white spider, I've really gotten used to it because it didn't even pop in my head in the movie. And I really liked the look of the character and those veins coming out of him looked really neat. And I thought, I kept thinking of what will Carnage look like in the next movie, you know? Uh, will he, you know, especially when he taps into... Uh, Cletus Cassidy's DNA, like that's how he's going to have to bond. Hopefully they do that that way. And how's he going to look if he's just straight up, you know, red and he's going to have black veins going through him? Like how are they going to do him? Because Carnage doesn't have a spider on his chest. There's no symbol to, you know, try to translate or not put on him. Uh, so they can just full on translate him the way he looks, which will be really cool. Um, but so the look of Venom was great. The look of uh, Riot even was was okay. Although um, in some of the battle scenes, you know, it, it I... 
had trouble sometimes uh, telling them apart a little bit. Uh, so we'll get into that in the dislikes. Uh, but as far as Venom himself, the way he looked, I thought it was great. And I would have liked to seen the other symbiotes. Uh, and we'll talk about that in my dislikes as well. I'm going to assume it's Phage and Scream because they're yellow and blue. And I think blue, uh, Phage was maybe a little bluish. I know Lasher's green, so I knew it wasn't Lasher. Or maybe it could have been Agony. I mean, I, Agony, I guess, could have been blue too. But uh, I'm not remembering the, the original colors off the top of my head. Uh, but I knew it wasn't Lasher. I saw some people saying maybe it was Lasher. But Lasher's green. I know that because I have the toy on the shelf behind me. So I know he's green and the character wasn't green. Or the symbiote wasn't green. It was blue. Um, so I would have liked to seen those symbiotes like actually form into symbiotes. Uh, but I guess every time they were put with a host, it didn't work. Except the rabbit. You just saw it kind of poking around in the rabbit when Scream was in the rabbit. But you didn't see, you know, it form around the rabbit or nothing like that. So I would have liked to have seen at least one scene of the other symbiotes. I thought that would have been great. And I would probably, we'll talk about that maybe and missed opportunities uh, for the movie. But uh, otherwise, the look of Venom, though, was really strong. Um, I really like the scene where Venom fought the SWAT team. That was a great sequence. I also like the use of his powers in that scene and how he kind of hopped around. But I also like the, the horror element of it at times where they um, threw, you know, like flash bombs at him and sound bombs or whatever. And they were like, uh, uh, you know, agitating the suit. So he's standing there and you'd see like all the tendrils go in one direction and you'd see the silhouette of it and stuff. And I thought that was really well done. As far as all the fight scenes go, that was one of my favorite fight scenes because I thought the cinematography still felt really good and smart like Matty Libatique style whereas some of the other ones seem like almost second unit were in charge of the fight scenes and they just seemed kind of messy so I really like that that SWAT uh, scene and I also liked at the end of it when he was going to eat the cop and you know you hear Eddie Brock's voice inside the symbiote going no 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 don't eat him he's a cop he's a cop um I really like that and I also liked his uh his security guard friend where Eddie's like no don't eat him he works three jobs you know to to, to provide for his family you do not eat him we're, we're going we're leaving now and he runs outside you know I like that too and I liked him acknowledging like hey i've been kind of a scumbag to this guy the security guard take taking advantage of him but i know deep down he's a good person and he has a family and he's trying to do the right thing and i don't want him to get hurt or eaten and i like that I, I thought all these were great character moments for eddie brock that i think a lot of people missed out on and the reason i picked up on all of them is because i seen the movie three times in three days i did a screening on tuesday screening on wednesday and then i paid for my tickets on thursday uh so yeah i've seen the movie three times in three days <laughs> so this movie is very fresh in my head for sure uh, it's hard to shut it out. Um, some of the Venom vs. Riot fight, I liked some of it, uh, but it did get a little messy at times. I liked when Carlton Drake and Eddie fought each other. I liked the moment where uh, Riot stabbed Eddie through the back. That was kind of neat. Um, I didn't really like the moment where Eddie's laying there and the symbiote's crawling to him. I love the music in that scene, as well as the music in the Venom vs. SWAT team scene. Lud, the music overall, the score, was great. And some of the choices of other songs, like Black Gold and uh, and some of the other songs that they played in the movie. Uh, minus the Eminem song, I'm still not, that song's not growing on me. But all the other songs I really liked. Uh, especially the song they played where they did the Brock Report scene. Um, that was kind of a good song. A hip-hop song was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of good stuff in here music-wise. But that scene where Venom is like, you know, the suit's coming to him and Eddie Brock's kind of dead that it happened so fast. And that's one of my negatives, and we'll talk about that in the movie, uh, or in my later part of this review where I talk about the dislikes. Uh, we'll talk about the editing, because the editing hurt some of this movie for me big time. Uh, and some scenes that I thought should have lingered more, uh, they definitely didn't you know, do that. They definitely were trying to cut it down to a certain length uh, for various reasons, I'm sure, uh, but reasons I probably won't agree with, and reasons that I hope some of those scenes, the longer versions, end up in the Blu-ray, for sure. Um, but uh, the cinematography, Matty Libatique, like I said, I thought his look of the movie was really great. I liked how he shot San Francisco and Atlanta as San Francisco at times. Um, even though I could kind of tell the difference between some of them, um, it was nice to you know get a consistent look on some of those scenes and let the camera kind of linger on these character moments, like with Mrs. Chen, who I really liked that character in the movie. She was great. Um, I liked Maria, who was played by um, uh, uh, Melora Walters, who we talked about. I had theorized that she was in this movie based off of her having a stunt double. And I even said that maybe she was a woman that jumps through the glass to pass the suit on to Eddie. Turns out I was 100% right on that one. So it was uh, great to see her in this movie. I'm a big fan of hers. So it was cool to see her. And she played this really uh, sweet role where she had this you know, back and forth with Eddie about the newspapers. And how Eddie's like, hey, these are free newspapers. You're charging me for newspapers? And they have that really nice setup. And then the payoff is that Eddie knows who she is when he sees her, and that gives him motivation to try to break open the door and save her. Not that she's just another random person, because we know at this point he's kind of given up on saving his fellow man, as he says, but when he sees her, 
he's like, oh, I, you know, I got to do something. And that harkens to the comic books, too, where he, in Lethal Protector, protects the homeless. And he kind of considers himself among them and befriends some of them. So that was a nice kind of nod to that comic book in that way as well. But yeah, the cinematography was fantastic. And Maddie Libatique did a really great job, you know, moving the camera around, uh, you know, capturing certain things in, in frame and, uh, you know, having stuff happen in the background or in silhouette and a lot of stuff, you know, that really worked for me. And so the look of the movie overall, I really dug. I especially love the scene where um, uh, Michelle Lee, who plays uh, Riot when Riot crash lands at the beginning, and she's like the EMT person. Originally, she was listed as Donna Diego, so we thought she might be Scream, but they changed her name on the IMDb to EMT person, Uh slash riot host and so um that also explains why vicky in who plays the old lady who gets possessed she was originally listed as donna diego old donna diego uh, and that makes sense now and why there's that was that confusion was because it's this you know two different actresses playing riot right after one another um so when michelle Lee's walking and she's kind of like a zombie like walking down and there's like this fog around her this yellow fog i really like that because it reminded me of the second crow movie where uh, I think uh, Pope was the director, I can't remember his first name, uh, uh, but he like directed uh, The Crow, City of Angels, and there he put this blanket of smog over Los Angeles in that movie, and he made it yellow, and it was kind of like this jaundice color, like this sickly looking, you know, like you don't want to breathe it in kind of toxic air. And that was great seeing it in this, where she's like walking and there's like this yellow fog around her, and it kind of dissipates as she moves through and then enters and grabs the eel and eats it and then kills everybody there, and then transfers, uh, you know, bodies and stuff. I thought that was a really great looking sequence overall, um, as far as cinematography goes, and also performances and uh, and just the look of things. I thought that was really cool. Uh, but yeah, Maria, she was great. Mrs. Chen, uh, Jacob, who was played by Martin B uh, Bats Bradford, I saw on the INDB and the credits of the movie that his character's name is Jacob, which is another biblical name because we had Jared Bankins. Uh, Jared Bankins also played Isaac in the movie, and he was the first one to get tested on. And Martin Bats Bradford, he got tested on too. And he was the one who successfully bonded after a couple days, I think four days of the symbiote in him, he finally started to adjust. And then that's who they strapped to the table and they found out that the decibels, the sound decibels were hurting him. Um, so that was great to see him in an in a actual pivotal point in the movie as far as knowledge goes, where the Life Foundation, uh, Life Foundation learns that sound can hurt the symbiotes. Even though they don't really use it for anything, I feel like that's just there kind of for the audience. But normally when you do a scene like that, you give that information to the villain so they can use it to their advantage later on when they need to um and they they really didn't i think they put eddie brock in that room when they were going to interrogate him and they put the two sound lights next to him kind of like the ones martin bat spradford had so i noticed that there was like a visual reference of them that they were going to use the sound to torture eddie brock but since he didn't have the suit on him it didn't matter so it kind of made that a little moot uh, but but still, I thought Martin uh, Bradford did great in that moment because he had the sympathetic look when they looked at him in the cage. He had this really like, you know, kind of sympathetic look, you know, uh, seeing the world for the first time kind of look, innocence to him. And then when he was strapped to the table, you could tell that the host was dying. And that performance was really great. So all these like smaller roles and people like, you know, I'm not just shouting them out because they did intros for the show, but it was just great to see a lot of them in the movie. And really take their roles seriously and really do a great job in the few moments that we had them because it made me feel something for them that the isaac moment when he got you know experimented on that was really great martin bats bradford that was great seeing mrs manfredi with her dog at the hospital that was really awesome too and that's obviously a silver main reference she talked about her husband waking up from his like you know condition whatever he's in and he's uh you know uh, yelling like he normally does she was like oh he sounds like he's a big whiner just like he's always been um and she was saying that to uh, dr dan lewis and uh, that was great, too, because it was like, hey, we know Ellen. She's great. Ellen Gerstein, who plays Mrs. Manfredi. But we also could assume that maybe in the bed there is the actual character of Silvermane, uh, possibly. So that was neat. Again, all the, the smaller roles. The guy who played the guard at the uh, Life Foundation, or not the Life Foundation, but the news reporting place where Eddie Brock was like, hey, you can't park your motorcycle there. Like that guy, he was really good. I think his character's name was Richard. And then also Jack, who is Eddie's boss at the place, um, who's played by Ron Cephas, who was like in Daredevil and you know Luke Cage and those shows. Uh, I think he was in Luke Cage. Um, but uh, he was great as Eddie Brock's boss. Uh, and I liked the scenes that they were together in. I really liked Jenny Slate in this movie. I thought she was awesome as Dora Skirth. Um, the name is still, uh, you know, I don't know about that name for the character, but I really, she brought a lot to her role. And I really liked uh, her character in the movie. And I felt really bad for her when her kids got threatened by Dr. Carlton Drake. That, you could see it on her face. She emoted really well when she was, you know, let down by Eddie Brock, when she tried to recruit him and he wouldn't, you know, go for it. 
that was really great. And then even when she did recruit Eddie Brock and she got through that little gate to with security and she was able to slip by, you could tell this is a woman who doesn't sneak around and do things like this. And the first time she did, she was successful at it. So her face kind of shows that. She's kind of like, huh, hey, we, we did it. It worked. I got Eddie Brock in. Um, and the, But then she's back to business. All right, we got it. I got him in because he's here to help me expose this and save lives. Um, so I really liked her character. She was fantastic. Uh, and then as far as everything else goes, I mean, the opening scene, I really liked too with the crash and all that stuff, but I would have maybe edited a little bit differently. I would have liked to seen, uh, some more at the front of that, like with the astronauts actually finding the, you know, the symbiotes, but uh, we'll get into that into missed opportunities. But overall, that's all the things I liked about this movie. So let's talk really quickly about the things that I didn't like about the movie. The major thing I didn't like in this movie, um, and it's something that's, it's a bummer because it was something that clearly was a lot of hard work was put into it. Um, and that was the motorcycle chase scene. I really did not see a point to this chase scene. And I would even say that it wasn't shot extremely well uh, compared to other chase scenes I've seen in movies. Uh, it just didn't work for me on a lot of levels. It was nice to see Eddie moving and the symbiote getting him to do things that you normally wouldn't see people do on a motorcycle. He flies up, the suit comes out, grabs the motorcycle, pulls him back in. He's making a sharp turn. The suit, you know, becomes liquid and rolls on the ground. And then he like, you know, hooks around the corner really quickly. Um, he throws the two cars into, you know, that are chasing him into other cars. Uh, he uses like a car door to stop, you know, like a, a drone from blowing up on him. I didn't really like any of that. It, I, you know, the, my second and third time, especially watching it, is when I realized how little I liked it because I totally mentally checked out during that sequence. I didn't find it very interesting, and I, I kind of wish that money that was spent making that scene and doing all those stunts, uh, I kind of wish was done, you know, to add more to the intro and spend that money on, you know, use that budget for, you know, showing, you know, John Jameson finding the symbiote on the comet and doing a little bit more backstory there or, you know, doing some other things that we'll talk about in missed opportunities uh, with powers and stuff that the symbiotes have that they didn't use in the movie. Um, but yeah, I would have liked to have seen something else other than chase sequence. I think you could have had him jump out the window, go to his bike, a drone hits the bike, blows it up. Now he's on foot and he has to, he's running and then, you know, maybe the cars chase him like a block or two and then he becomes Venom and just get to the Venom quicker. I understand they were building up anticipation, but at this point we're already like an hour into the movie and I felt the buildup was already there and I kind of just wanted to see him become Venom already and the chase sequence just prolonged that but not in a very interesting way to me. I didn't feel like the chase sequence did that much. It felt redundant because in the first scene when he's in the apartment and he's beating up all the guys and he's like doing the upgrade thing, you know, I, I got him bring up that movie because I really like that movie this year. Um, and we always knew that we were going to, we were going to make comparisons to it, uh, after we saw the trailer for both movies. <laughs> but, uh, but with this one, he had that kind of upgrade scene where he's like, you know, shocked. He's like, you know, the suit's acting out and he's like fighting everybody. And he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he just kind of slaps sticky in a way that scene already exists there. So everything he did on the motorcycle felt redundant to that because it's him going like, what, what? And the tendrils are coming out and it's throwing cars and everything. And it's like, yeah, you kind of already did that though on a personal scale, on a smaller scale. And I liked that in the apartment. Now that he's out, he needs to be venom and he needs to, you know, start fighting these guys, maybe tear a couple of them apart, you know, do something like that. Uh, so the chase sequence didn't add a lot to the movie to me other than time and money that could have been spent, I think, on other more interesting things that, you know, we needed in this movie uh, to kind of boost it up a little bit. Uh, but that's just my opinion, obviously. Um, also, Riot. I did not like Riot in this movie. Uh, very boring character. The whole first, you know, half of the movie where he's just jumping between female hosts. I, is there a reason? Like, uh, they don't give any backstory really to Riot. They say he's a team leader who is meant to lead an armada to Earth and wipe out Earth. And then with, you know, two of the other symbiotes dying now, he's like, you know, okay, I have to do this. And when he finds out Venom's a traitor, he's like, all right, now my only option is to take a ship back to where we're from, which they never mentioned Clintar in the movie, which I was kind of bummed about. But uh, they never, you know, he's like, I'm going to go out to space, grab some more of our people and bring them back, which that's kind of like Planet of the Symbiotes. Just Riot wasn't the one who came up with that plan in Planet of the Symbiotes. But it kind of does pull from that where they want to, you know, one symbiote wants to lead an invasion back to Earth. And uh, and it just, you didn't find out that motivation until like, you know, third until the last act of the movie. And so his character is just completely underdeveloped. And he has this power, like kind of like Fallen. Like I said, I mentioned that movie, Denzel Washington and Fallen, where Azazel can just touch somebody and just transfer to them quicker in, in a blink of an eye. Unlike Eddie, you know, or Venom, who has to like, it's a whole process. And the other symbiotes, it's a whole process. But with, uh, you know, with Riot, it's instant. And I think that could have been really cool. And you could have played up a scene where Eddie is surrounded by people 
and any one of them could be Riot, and he's like afraid to hurt anybody, and he's trying to tell the symbiote, we can't just kill everybody here, and the suit's like, you know, that, that would have been a good scene where the suit's like, no, we can kill everyone, and we'll definitely get Riot, and Eddie's like, no, there are good people here, we can't just kill innocent people, and you know, you could have had that banter back and forth. Um, they should have done something interesting with that power, and they didn't at all. Um, and then his motivation, like I said, pops up in the last 30 minutes, and you don't you don't get a sense of anything with the character. Plus, it took him six months. He goes from Michelle Lee into Vicky N, and uh, and you know into the old lady. And once she he's in her, then uh, you know he spends six months in Malaysia before finally taking a plane back to the U.S. But then he chooses like the body of a young girl, like. So if, so they don't give any reason why he chooses his host. Obviously, he needs perfect hosts. These, all these people, all these creatures need the perfect host to survive. But he keeps choosing, like, you know, he's like, uh, EMT woman, old lady, little girl. And so I'm like, what is the logic there? Uh, I want to know. I want to know what the logic is. And they, the movie doesn't give it to you. Um, so Scream and Phage, I'm guessing it's Phage or maybe it's Agony, but the other two symbiotes, the yellow and blue one, they both die in the movie uh, and they're just wasted. I mean, we never see what they look like other than when they bond with someone temporarily, but the yellow one, Scream, bonds with the rabbit and then there's a quick shot where they show the rabbit dead and the yellow you know, suit pouring out of it and Carlton Drake's upset by that. And then there's a scene where he comes and sees Dora Skirth. Her body's on the ground. It merged after they took it off Martin Bat Bradford. They took the blue one off him and they put it on Dora Skirth. And then the other, uh, apparently, the other doctors just sat and watched it die for medical purposes which i don't get that either they already watched one die and the yellow one so to me it, those two symbiotes were completely wasted almost didn't even need to be in the movie you could have reduced it to one symbiote and just didn't scream and then you could have showed somebody actually become scream for like a scene or two and then get put down and then they realize oh we use the sound it accidentally killed it and maybe that's how they learned that sound hurts it or fire hurts it or something you know so that to me would have been much better if they would have just reduced those to one symbiote and it died during like a test and they were like oh crap we can't do that test again it killed the symbiote you know um so yeah having two of them and die the same way just felt like a waste of them and we never got to see them so that was a bummer too uh, the use of Riot's powers, like I said, that was a bummer. I didn't like that. The editing at times, I definitely didn't like with during some dialogue scenes where people were just talking and then it would just it just felt really quick. Like when Eddie was in his apartment and he comes in and the, the suit goes, who the hell is this guy? And then as soon as he's done saying the word guy, you know, the, you know, he's already talking, you know, Reese is already talking. He's like, Eddie, give us the bug. And, you know, and then it's like, it's so quick. And I understand Reese can't hear the Venom suit. So he would come in and just start talking. I get it. He would start demanding orders or, just, you know, throwing out orders and demanding things from Eddie. But from a movie standpoint, it doesn't flow as well. Even when he says, let's pile up all their bodies and put them in the corner and bite their heads off. You know, as soon as he finishes that line, it's like he rushed that line to get it in because they didn't, you know, plan it too well when they're moving the camera around and they had Eddie say, why would we do that? It happened so quick. And the, even in the dialogue at the end with Anne and Eddie, when they're sitting on the, you know, outside Anne's apartment together and they're talking, the cuts are really quick for their dialogue and it doesn't allow things to linger. And, uh, and that, you know, that was kind of a bummer for me. And we saw some of that in earlier the, the clips that were released with Carlton Drake talking to Eddie. Those scenes were a little bit longer than they were when they showed it to us online, but not much longer. And some of that editing is, is pretty tight in, uh, in a bad way, in my opinion. So there was some of that. And then some of the editing during the fights kind of gave me a little bit of a headache, uh, which was a bummer. So uh, the editing at times in this movie, I definitely feel like hurt uh, the movie, especially with these gorgeous shots by Madeleine Libetic and some of these great performances by these actors felt like, you know, they were kind of cut short or ruined by this quick editing technique. And apparently there was two editors on this movie and, uh, I, you know, credit to both of them. I'm sure they worked really hard on this movie, but uh, for me, they, they their techniques ruined a couple scenes from the movie. Uh, and so I definitely have to put that on my dislike list. As far as characters that I didn't really care for in this movie, I, I, I hate to say this because I think all of them did a pretty good job. And again, this is my opinion. You guys may not agree with me and that's fine. If not, you know, let me know down below. Um, but Dr. Dan, like Reed Scott's character, he wasn't super necessary for this story. Um, I understand they wanted to do the MRI thing and they wanted someone, you know, to, you know, have Eddie have a connection to do, go do an MRI, I guess. Um, or they wanted to show that Anne Wang is moving on. She's like, unlike Eddie, she, you know, the juxtaposition, she's moving on. She's dating. Eddie's not, he's still hung up on her. Um, I get, I get it. I get the purpose overall, why he's there. Uh, but he didn't work a lot of times for me as a character. And, uh, and he was just like the good guy boyfriend. He kind of reminds me of the dad from um, 
uh, what was it, Ant-Man, where the mom is dating a new guy and he's like a cop. And he's got a couple funny lines or a couple funny scenes. But overall, like in the first Ant-Man, he didn't really add a ton to the movie, I feel. But in the second one, I thought he added a little bit more because there was like he was more friendly with, um, you know, Ant-Man's character. This one, Dan kind of felt like a mix between those two versions of that character from the Ant-Man universe. And he was like, oh, you like him? You know, he's not like a dis... You know, it's like you're not rooting for them to break up, him and Anne. But at the same time, you're rooting for Eddie and Anne to get back together, kind of. Or at least that's the direction they steer you in. Um, but uh, but then you have Dan in the way, and he's also a nice guy. So, I don't know. I, I didn't... His character didn't add a lot to his movie. If you just wanted to have Eddie Brock get an MRI and, and Anne be there, you could have done that without him. Like, he's not essential to the story other than showing that, you know, Anne has moved on. That's it. I mean, but that's that's all he really serves the purpose of, uh, in my opinion. Uh, because anyone could have called a doctor while he was eating lobsters at that restaurant. You didn't need Dan to be the one to do that. You know, Anne could have done that herself. So again, didn't really, I like Reed Scott. He, he did all right in the movie overall, but the character didn't really matter too much uh, to me. Uh, Carlton Drake also, I really, I like Riz Ahmed, but man, I was not a big fan of him in this movie. He was, uh, not very intimidating. He was, you know, not that he has to be, he's, you know, kind of like a, a science guy who's, you know, on top of the world in a way and trying to change the world. But at the same time, he was, I don't know, he was like, he, I, I was like, I should be afraid of him. Even when he threatened, uh, Doris Skirth's kids, I was like, well, he threatened her kids. That's bad. But I mean, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm not afraid of him doing it, I guess. Uh, he didn't really intimidate me. Uh, he didn't seem like he intimidated her too much either in that scene. Even though Jenny Slate did a good job acting scared, it didn't really, I don't know, that, that chemistry that was supposed to be there, I didn't see it. And Carlton Drake overall, just, I didn't understand really what he wanted to do. I mean, I understand, he full on says, hey, I want to change the world and we need to go out in the space. But none of that, like, it's all crazy. Like, it's all just mad scientisty crazy and i get that's kind of the character he, he becomes as the movie progresses but then once he bonded with riot i knew his character was done i was like all right there's some interesting things here with his character but once he bonded with riot he was just riot after that and it didn't matter like he you know he was when he apologized like i'm sorry i killed your friends but you know i'm trying to do this and then he's like well don't worry we'll use the shuttle and we'll bring more back here and it's like okay he's getting his wish he's going to get out go out in space and see the universe and everything um but uh, to me, it was clearly that Riot was driving the ship from there, and uh, Carlton Drake was just being strung along. And I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really care for Carlton Drake in the movie. Uh, you know. And I know some of you guys will probably disagree with me, but I didn't at all. Uh, and also, Anne. Uh, I liked the scene with She-Venom a lot. Uh, I really liked that scene. I know a lot of people gave the movie crap for that scene, but I really liked that scene. I thought She-Venom looked great, and I liked the idea that the suit, at this point, saw what Anne was willing to do for Eddie. He used it, she used the MRI to separate the suit from Eddie and uh, and saved you know Eddie's life in the process, but also almost killed the suit. And then the suit went and bonded with the dog, and then it came back and saw Anne after Eddie got taken away. And I like that moment where they're connecting and they're looking at each other in the hallway. And I was like, ooh, I wonder what's going to happen now. And then so when she showed up as She Venom, I was like, that's really great because that's certainly the suit trying to play Cupid. It realizes that these two love each other. It's been bonded with Eddie already, but now once it bonds with Anne, it realizes that deep down she still loves Eddie. So it kind of nudges her and says, hey, you know, since you're going to be, you know, it, they talk about it in the comics too, how the suit will bring out some of your darker desires. The reason Eddie sometimes kills and bites heads off is because he gives in to the power sometimes. He's seduced by it. And so I could kind of see Anne you know, with the suit in her, it's kind of your id, right? It's the dark voice in your head. It points out to Eddie, hey, you're, it tells him the things Eddie won't admit to himself. Hey, you're a loser. Uh, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're sad when you're around Anne. It, I imagine it did that for Anne too. And uh, it says, deep down, you love Eddie. So just kiss him, kiss him one more time. And so, you know, it, she leans in and does the kiss, but the suit is already peeling back. Like I know when they connect, the suit, you know, is connecting in a way, but the suit peels back pretty quickly and transfers over to Eddie. And it's Eddie also accepting the suit back. Um, and then, you know, and them having that kiss moment uh, because obviously the suit is trying to play Cupid with them. So I think the, the suit has an affection for Eddie, but it wants Eddie to be happy too. And, uh, and I think that's part of the bonding process. And I think, you know, maybe we'll find out in the second movie that maybe the suit Venom had like a, its version of an Anne or something, even though in the comics they reproduce asexually, but maybe they still have these feelings and stuff. Um, obviously they have feelings, so it would be neat to see that maybe that's also why it plays Cupid with them because maybe it 
was connected to something like an its version of an Anne back on Clintar or something. I don't know. It could be. It could open up for future stories. So I, I like that moment overall, and I like moments with Michelle Williams and her acting in some scenes. But ultimately, they don't give her a ton to do, and then the stuff they do give her to do, you're kind of like, how is she doing this? Like when she shows up and she just immediately goes over to the one switch that turns on the sound frequencies when they're on the shuttle. To me, I thought that you know not to take anything away from Anne because I want her to do things on her own without having like another character tell her what to do because that's what I felt like Dan was doing every time he was around is he was kind of like telling her things um except for the moment when she separated the suit so it was like oh good she she did that on her own she broke up with Eddie on her own I like characters that make their own decisions uh but when she goes over and she turns the the frequency I kind of was like well it would have been neat if that doctor that got stabbed was still kind of alive and said like and she comes in she's like I need you know sound sound hurts them and maybe he's like you know, points at a, a machine and then she runs over to that machine and looks at that console and finds the button or something because, you know, I don't know, she just kind of ran in and knew what to do. And I understand it's shorthand storytelling, but at the same time, it's like, uh, you know, give, give me a little something in that moment uh, to, you know, to believe it a little bit more. But it was cool to see her have a moment at the end where she played a, a small part in, you know, the salvation and saving of Eddie when he was, you know, merged with Riot, when him and Venom were merged with Riot. Uh, but overall, her character, it was like 50-50 with me. I wouldn't put her fully in the dislikes. I would put her like half in the dislikes and half in the likes. Uh, but otherwise, you know, the Life Foundation, kind of their motivation, their goal, felt like wasn't focused enough. I felt like they kind of got the shorthand. Uh, in the Resident Evil movies, they focused on Umbrella a lot and paint a picture of what kind of company they are. And in this movie, they just focused on the bad things that, you know, they do. And they just kind of really brushed across the good things they do in the opening. Like when Ariadna and the film crew was there filming Eddie Brock talking to Carlton Drake. I felt like that was the only moment there. And then when Carlton Drake's talking to the kids about the future and that we all may live in space, that was like the only thing that really gives you an insight on the Life Foundation. But you really don't get a full sense of them and what their ultimate goals are. And then I think Dora Skirt says some throwaway line like, oh, I thought we were developing cures for cancer, but now he wants to go into outer space and do all this stuff. And you're kind of like... Who would work for a company like that? Like, it just seems so chaotic. So I felt like they were a little bit underdeveloped. You know, they were very clear-cut, their goals in the comics. In the movie, it just seemed to, like the goals were there, and they focused on some of their goals, but I didn't really understand them overall. Uh, but that's okay. I guess I didn't understand the Umbrella Corporation. It seemed like they just wanted to wipe out the world, really, with T-viruses. Um, but to Life Foundation, you know, that, that kind of... But that wasn't a big dislike. Uh, I did, you know, the other stuff probably more so. But yeah, those are my dislikes of this movie. So now let's talk real quickly about uh, the missed opportunities I felt this movie could have done. And then also some of the Easter eggs that I found in this movie. A quick few missed opportunities I felt uh, were definitely in the intro. I would have liked to see in the movie open with John Jameson and a couple astronauts in space and actually, you know, finding the symbiotes. Like I said, I would have cut the motorcycle uh, chase scene and all the, you know, effects and all the, you know, stunt teams. And I, it's granted, everybody needs work. I understand that. Um, but at the same time, I would have probably forfeited that scene uh, because it didn't tell new, completely new information, I felt. Uh, only the ending did when he becomes Venom. But that you could have done right outside the apartment building, in my opinion, um, or in, even in the apartment if you wanted to cut it that closely. But I think outside would have worked better anyway um but uh, i would have liked to seen something at the beginning that showed them finding the symbiote that was kind of a you know harken back to you know the spider-man animated series which a lot of us know venom from you know like that was you know when i was a kid i wasn't reading spider-man comics for a long time and then when the animated series was starting up you know that was my first exposure to some of those spider-man characters that i never read during all those years after craven's last hunt because my mom was like you, you know this book ended in a horrible suicide you can't read spider-man anymore and i'm like oh okay and then it was like all right so for like eight years i didn't read spider-man comics and then that cartoon started up or six or seven years maybe but then that cartoon started up and you know it was my first exposure to a lot of characters and venom included and so uh so seeing that would have been really nice uh you know it would have been really awesome to see john jameson do that and that is john jameson i saw other reviewers saying well he says the name jameson but that's all they say because we saw that there's one astronaut lived and it was jameson but if you wait till the credits there actually is someone playing john jameson the uh, third j jonah jameson's son John Jameson. Uh, so that is, that's John's real name. Uh, that is in the credits of the movie. And so it counts. He's John Jameson. And hopefully he's not dead uh, because I would like to see him transformed into Man Wolf and build this Sony universe as like a monster universe. You have Venom, 
who's kind of like Jekyll and Hyde. You have Morbius, kind of like Dracula, and you have uh, Man Wolf, kind of be your werewolf character. Uh, and then you can bring in other characters like your Frankenstein's and your stuff. But to me, this is like that's what Sony should do. They should make their version of like superhero monsters in a way. Uh, that would be really great. And there's enough Spider-Man characters to do that with, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was a missed opportunity to do something at the beginning. Uh, but then also the biggest missed opportunity, I felt, was the memories. The, uh, the you know, almost like the blood memories or the, the, the imprinted memories that the symbiotes get when they transfer from host to host. This was a power that wasn't even talked about at all in the movie. And that would have been great because it would also explain why the symbiote has kind of an affinity for Eddie because think about that scene where Eddie is helping that, you know, gives 20 bucks to Maria, you know, played by Melora Walters. When he gives her $20 and he's like, hey, you know, I'll, I'll buy the paper from you. You don't have to sing. And they have like this kind of sweet moment. She's like, thank you. And he goes, no, thank you. And you're welcome. You know, and they kind of like, you know, kind of being super friendly with each other. And he's, you know, um, not treating her as like a homeless person, you know, like some people like dismissive, he's treating her like a human being. Um, and uh, and I like that. And I think that would play more to if you showed when, when she transfers the suit to Eddie, if Eddie got some of her life memories, if he saw the moment she became homeless, the you know, how sad she feels maybe when, um, you know, Eddie walks away from her because maybe he's the only person who does talk to her throughout an entire day span. Um, I thought that would have been a great way to add character development, but also give Eddie something. In the comics and Dark Origin, they have that great scene where the suit wraps around Eddie and Eddie can see Peter Parker's life, or the memories at least that uh, the symbiote had with Peter Parker. It can see uh, life from a little rat creature out in outer space. It can see Clintar. It can see the planet. And it's just really quick flashes. But I thought that would have been great in the movie when he got the suit if he saw moments like that. And then later on in the movie, try to go, you know, use the meditation technique because that was set up and that was never paid off. And you can have Eddie Brock go and like, you know what? I know how to meditate. Maybe we can sit here for a minute, meditate, and look through your memories and find out what Riot wants. Or we can find out, you know, how to defeat him. Or maybe, you know, if he ever got beaten on Clintar or something like, you know, use that technique, use that meditation, that stuff that was set up. Use all these elements that are there in the movie that don't pay off. And then use those, you know, memories that uh, that can transfer from host to host. And then it would also give Eddie a different appreciation for the Maria character. And then when Anne transfers the stuff back to Eddie, maybe Eddie would secretly know that Anne still loves him. You know, there's so many things you could have done story-wise with that ability, and they don't do it. So to me, that was really the only big missed opportunity in this film as far as what the film presented. I know a lot of people are like, no, what about Spider-Man? What about this? I'm rating this movie on what we got because that's what you're supposed to do as a critic. Uh, you're not supposed to put in all these elements that you want to see or that you wish were there that you you know are fanboying out for. Uh, I am rating this movie as it is. And as it is, that to me was the biggest missed opportunity, even more so than an extended opening. Uh, but this, the memories, I think that would have been really great to add to this movie and it would have helped with the narrative and uh, added a cool new technique and storytelling element that you don't see in these kinds of movies. And last but not least, let's talk about the Easter eggs of this movie. Uh, the Easter eggs are pretty simple. We had John Jameson, we talked about already. Uh, we had She-Venom, which is obviously a nod to the comic books when Anne Wang became She-Venom. She bit someone's head off, and then she was like, you know, oh no, I, you know, I don't want to do this, Eddie. Like first, Eddie put the suit on her to heal her because Sin Eater shot her, and so he was using it to heal her so that way, um, you know, she could, you know, bounce back and stuff. Uh, and then so he kind of wrapped her around the suit, and that was like her first experience. But then when she became She-Venom, um, and and she, you know, went crazy. She actually bit, uh, you know, a guy's head off, killed a couple people. And this, you know, Eddie even says, look, and you must have deep down wanted to kill those guys because that's what the suit does. It finds your deepest feelings and brings them out in you. And so, uh, so when she bites the guy's head off in this movie, she's like, oh my God, I bit someone's head off. It was treated more comically because Eddie instantly was like, oh, no, 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 I know how that feels. It's really weird. I, I understand. So they had they used it as a moment to connect with each other. Uh, but in the comics, that led Anne down a very dark path where she was afraid of the suit and afraid of the feelings that were inside of her, and it caused her eventually to commit suicide after Eddie showed back up in the black suit, and then she saw Spider-Man in the black suit, uh, as we talked about on the show before. So, um, yeah, if you ever want to go back and watch our old episodes where we dissect the comics, we've definitely gone over a lot of things, and you'll see a lot of things we talk about in those comics end up in this movie or the tone of those stories end up in this movie and that's why ultimately i like the movie more than i dislike it uh because you know it is pretty faithful considering it doesn't have it's a story without spider-man 
other than that, it's it's pretty faithful to the character. And even with the Easter eggs, we have Barney Bushkin is someone that Eddie Brock calls or texts. I think they also talk about Paul Barnum, who's another person I think that worked at the Daily Globe. But they mentioned the Daily Globe in this. You know, Anne, we talked about that scene before where she knew you know Eddie Eddie was fired in the comics. He worked for the Daily Globe. He was trying to crack the Sin Eater story, and the Sin Eater was uh, turned out to be a dirty cop who was killing people, including other police officers um, at the time, including June De uh, DeWolf, Jean DeWolf, who was, uh, you know, like one of the top uh, detectives that was in Spider-Man comics at the time. So when she died, that set the city, of, you know, flame, and they're like, no, we got to find out who this killer is. So Eddie was writing the story, and he was interviewing a guy who he believed to be the real Sin Eater. And it turned out this guy was just taking credit. He was hearing voices. He lived next door to the Sin Eater, the real Sin Eater. And the Sin Eater was like, you know, talking out loud, talking to himself at night. And this guy thought he was hearing voices. And he was already, you know, like a, a you know, previously on meds for hearing voices. So he thought this was, you know, him going crazy. So he admitted to the killings, but it wasn't him. And so when Eddie Brock was outed as a, a fraud, it ruined him and it caused him to lose his job and his reputation and everything. So Ann mentions that. She's like, I don't want a repeat of what happened in New York. No one will hire you over there. And he's like, oh, come on. I still have credit in New York. But then when you see after they break up, he's calling people, texting people, um, and no one will hire him. And some of those names he comes across is Barney Bushkin, who is this old manager at Daily Globe. It's his old supervisor, person he worked for, the person he t turned stories into, his editor-in-chief, uh, who had a rival with J. Jonah Jameson in the comics. Um, I think he even, like, you know, wore, like, a robot suit one time. I don't even, I don't remember. I, Barney is, like, a weird character. He showed up a couple times in the comics at, uh, since then, uh, but his name was mentioned. I think Paul Barnum's name might have been mentioned, but I can't remember. But he also worked at the Daily Globe. Um, I have to go back when the movie comes out. I know I've seen it three times but it wasn't enough for me to remember all the names of people he was texting and stuff and I couldn't see them really quickly they pop up on screen really fast so I'm pretty sure when the DVD and Blu-ray come out I will go through frame by frame and we'll do an episode on other people he contacted because maybe there's some other Easter eggs in there but I think Paul Barnum might have been in there also chocolate they mentioned chocolate in the movie that is something that the symbiote ate in the comic books uh, so that's really important to the symbiote and the lore of the character uh, and then obviously Stan Lee and he has a very meta line where he says you know don't give up on her either of you and he's talking to, to Eddie and the suit as Stanley always shows up when he makes a cameo. It's a very meta way. He's fully aware of things. He's obviously talked to the Watchers, as we saw in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. He's telling them stories, and they can see everything. And yet, Stan is still telling them stories. Um, so, yeah, he has a very meta line, uh, meta line about, you know, don't leave her, either one of you. And so, you know, Eddie's like, don't worry, we won't, you know, or whatever. So, yeah, that was kind of cool. So those are all the kind of Easter eggs I could see right off the top of my head uh, after three viewings. But I'm sure there are more, and I'm sure I'll find them when we watch the Blu-ray. Okay, so that is my very long and very detailed review of Venom. And uh, like I said, we went over all the spoilers. We talked about everything that I personally liked, things I personally disliked. Uh, but overall, my score. So I did say at the beginning of this, uh, I had originally my first impressions was 7.5 to 8. Um, and I still kind of stand near that. But I would say I would put it more at a 7 now. Um, it's or seven and seven and a half, like somewhere between there. So I can't kind of did drop half a point. And I think just after seeing it three times, uh, some of the things that I disliked really like were blaring that third time. And I was like, okay, I still like the movie overall. The fun I had watching it was really great. Uh, both the first time when I saw it in a room with Tom Hardy, obviously my first impression was really good because I was like, you know, sitting in the theater with Tom. We had that experience of meeting him and Ruben Fleischer and everything. Uh, that definitely added to it. Um, so I think where maybe that's where the half point comes from because when I watched it also on Wednesday and then Thursday I was with friends and there were no celebrities no one showed up nothing like that it was just the movie and the audience and it was cool because I on the Wednesday audience uh, they were very loud and cheered on the Thursday audience there was maybe a couple people in there that were like you know were loud and cheered uh, but not the whole audience but the first screening definitely loud obviously Tom was there so it makes sense but the second one there was no celebrities there uh, it was just a private fan screening and it was fun in Burbank and uh, and that one like that people were you know excited for it for the most part it got a little quiet at the end after the post credit stuff uh, but uh, but then the you know the post credit scenes we'll talk about real quick too I wasn't a big fan of the dialogue in the post credit scene or the mid credit scene with Carl uh, whenever they do that in movies, I just get, I, I roll my eyes. They did that with Dark Knight Rises. They were like, uh, you know, they, they were like, oh, you should use your real name, Robin. And it's like, really? That's his real name is Robin. Like, I, I just hate moments like that. So in this line, you know, when, when he's sitting there, he's like, don't worry, Eddie, when I get out, there's going to be glorious carnage. I'm just like, 
I get, I know why it's there. It's for the masses. A lot of people are going to like that and they're going to freak out over it. But me personally, I don't like lines like that. I just, when he was carving, you know, welcome Eddie and blood, that was enough for me. And then if he would have just said like, all right, Cletus, you know, tell me, you know, where do you want to start with this interview? And he's, and then he says something like, uh, well, it all began at an orphanage you know, or whatever. Like I would have rather something more character driven and not just like, Hey, uh, carnage. See, he's carnage. Uh, you know, that, did, that didn't really work for me. Uh, but the scene itself was fine. I mean, I know a lot of people complained about the wig. It's like, Hey, it's Woody Harrelson. He's bald. He's got to wear a wig. If he's going to be Cletus Cassidy, I will say that one little scene didn't fully sell me on him. So I'm kind of agreeing with uh, Demora. She's someone who's been commenting on my videos saying that she's not, she wasn't very happy about the casting of Cletus. So I would love to hear what you think, Demora, if you're still out there, um, it, you know, let me know down in the comments below what you think of his performance. It didn't fully sell me on it, but I do like him as an actor. And so in the next movie, knowing that it's going to be him versus Tom Hardy, that gets me excited for the sequel, which hopefully we'll get. We'll find out what the movie makes overall, uh, you know, financially at, on Monday. So I'll make a video on Monday about the box office. We'll wait until the final numbers are in and we'll make a video that day. And I'm off on Monday, so I'll catch up on videos with you guys then. Uh, but for now, you know, this is just my thoughts of the movie. Uh, I did kind of drop half a point, like I said, uh, based off of, you know, my feelings of the movie. But overall, it, it was still fun. Like the third time I watched it, you would think three times in three days, I would just full on hate the movie. No, the stuff I didn't like definitely were more blaring and in my face, and I liked them even less than I did the first time I saw them, but the stuff I liked, I, I still liked. It was, uh, pr I was pretty surprised. I was like, hey, you know what? I think more reviewers should probably see a movie, you know, two or three times before they actually write their reviews. Um, as much as that sounds probably awful to some people, I think you really get, you know, you can focus in on the stuff you really liked and the stuff you didn't. And you can see if your mind changes on things. And I'm pretty consistent. The stuff I liked the first viewing, I still liked on the third viewing. And the stuff I didn't like, I still disliked. So I would say this movie is pretty good overall. I liked it. I'd give it a 7 out of 10. But I want to hear what you guys think. Let me know down in the comments below. Give me like a quick little review of yours. Tell me what you rate it at the end of your comment. Try to keep the comments like, you know, to a paragraph at the most. Uh, you know, like a brief paragraph, five or six lines or something. And I will make a video where I read as many of them as I can to include you guys on this show because the show is not just about me it's about all of us we are Venom and I want to hear from you so do it down in the comments below and I'll make a video very soon where I respond to that thank you so much for watching my show as always like share subscribe all that fun stuff and I'll see you in the future peace